The eternal AMD versus Nvidia debate rages on in the vast expanse of the internet, but one community takes it to a whole other level. I am of course talking about the Linux gaming community, which seems to be full of people who refuse to entertain the idea of using an Nvidia GPU even for a millisecond. While I do think disliking Nvidia as a company is completely fine, since they have been doing some pretty dodgy stuff for a while, pretending that Nvidia GPUs break your Linux system every other day is plain silly and untrue. Also, pretending that AMD GPUs have zero issues under Linux due to meh open source drivers is also untrue. Both brands have their strengths and weaknesses, and in this video I want to discuss them. As someone who has a good amount of experience with both, I will be talking about the general desktop experience, the gaming experience, and the feature set of each brand. Now, before I start talking about the general desktop experience, I want to list the GPUs I've owned from both companies and how long I've used them on Linux. I used a GTX 1070 between 2019 and 2021. I bought an RX 6700 XT a week after it released and used it until mid-2023 when I upgraded to an RX 7900 XTX which I used until August of 2025, and I then upgraded to an RTX 5090. Okay, now that you have an idea of how long I've been using each brand on Linux, I can move on to talking about the general Linux desktop experience on NVIDIA and AMD. In short, it's better on AMD with some caveats. The entire AMD driver stack is open source and comes pre-installed on most Linux distributions. In most cases, you can just install a Linux distribution and your AMD graphics card will be fully functional by default. Desktop environment, compositor and display server developers can view the source code of the AMD graphics drivers and optimize their software for said drivers accordingly. This results in a very user-friendly, smooth and hassle-free experience for the vast majority of AMD graphics card owners. I say for the vast majority because RDNA 3 owners, like myself, did experience a notable issue, but that was the fault of the hardware itself, not the Linux software, since the same issue was also present under Windows. The issue I'm talking about is the high idle power draw of RDNA 3 cards when multiple monitors are connected. This happens because the VRAM frequency stays in its highest power state when it should be at its lowest. Apparently it has something to do with the display mode lines. Some work as expected and some cause issues. While it is better these days, the issue is still not gone and you have to use a custom refresh rate for your monitors to go around it. As I described in this post on the GitLab issue two years ago, also users with LG monitors tend to be more affected than anyone else. This, however, is a weird issue on RDNA 3 cards, which is also present on Windows. No other AMD GPU generation has this issue. As for NVIDIA, well, installing the drivers actually requires you to run one line in the terminal, which looks like this on Arch Linux. Then you need to run a second line to get your xconfig. Reboot, and you're ready to go. A bit more effort, but not scary or too much work by any stretch. I am running a Wayland compositor called Hyperland and it doesn't seem to have any issues running smoothly on my RTX 5090. I notice no difference between my experience on my 7900 XTX and on my 5090. That said, this is a very recent thing. Apparently, variable refresh rate did not work under Wayland until recently and it also relies on a feature present on Volta and newer GPUs. So, if you're one of the absolute gigachads still rocking a 1080 Ti or something, no variable refresh rate for you. Apparently, you didn't get the memo that the more you buy, the more you save. So go out and buy a 50 series card because Jensen needs someone to fund his new leather jacket. A recent Nvidia driver also broke GTK4 apps, but they fixed it on that day. Still, I do think it's worth mentioning since I don't remember even having this issue or anything similar on an AMD GPU. 
AMD have issues with display outputs, specifically HDMI 2.1. While the hardware itself supports it, the HDMI forum refuses to let anyone have an open source implementation of HDMI 2.1. So you can't have HDMI 2.1 functionality with AMD on Linux, since all their drivers are open source. NVIDIA has no such issues, since other than their kernel modules, their drivers and firmware are completely closed source. When it comes to X11, it works about the same on both brands. Although I remember experiencing horrible screen tearing on my GTX 1070, which could be fixed by forcing compositing in the NVIDIA driver, but that caused horrible micro stutter and performance loss in games. AMD's tear-free rendering option is a much better solution and provides a much smoother experience, although I would disable it during gaming, as it can increase input latency. Now that I think about it, why am I even talking about X11, you shouldn't really be using it in 2025 and most popular desktop environments. Default to Wayland. Just don't bother with it, honestly. Wayland seems to work very well on Nvidia for me, but there is no denying that the overall experience is better on AMD. Moving on to the gaming experience. Oh boy, where do I start? Well, Let's start with ray tracing performance, since the discussion will be very brief. AMD sucks at ray tracing. As you can see from this benchmark from the Pharonix review of the RX 9070 XT, the ray tracing performance of the most powerful AMD GPUs roughly matches the RTX 4070 Super. A rather pathetic showing for Team Red here, not gonna lie. But this will be the last negative thing I say about AMD in this section, because the open source drivers for AMD are genuinely phenomenal. Shader compilation stutter plagues modern games. It is everywhere, but the devs behind the RAD-V driver, which is the open source driver for AMD GPUs, came up with what has to be the most efficient shader compiler currently available. I had honestly forgotten how shader compilation stutters even felt since I didn't experience them for a very long time. When I tried playing games on my 5090, I experienced some shader compilation stutters for the first half an hour or so of gameplay, until the shader cache got built. This is actually a perfectly normal and standard thing. It's the AMD Vulkan driver that's the weird one here. You can buy a brand new game with no shader cache built and it would just run as smooth as butter on your AMD graphics card from beginning to end with no noticeable stutter. The 5090 runs games at a noticeably higher average frame rate than my 7900 XTX, but I do miss the completely stutter-free experience. I am now able to truly appreciate it after I have lost it. I believe this is a huge win for Team Red. Now, let's talk translation layers. For the most part, you will be playing Windows games running through Proton or Wine. Said games are also, for the most part, going to be using DX11 or DX12. Translating DirectX 11 and 12 to Vulkan, the API Linux supports natively, is done via DXVK and VKD3D, respectively. DXVK runs very well on both AMD and Nvidia, where both are able to achieve similar or better performance than running the game natively on Windows. VKD3D, however, does not like Nvidia. Like at all. You can get up to 50% less performance compared to Windows in some games. Sure, this is not in all games, but in some cases the performance degradation is so jarring that it makes you regret your GPU choice. This issue has been around since VKD3D has been released, and it is not something that can be fixed by the VKD3D devs, since they can't look at NVIDIA's driver source code and optimize for it. At this point, it's up to NVIDIA's engineers to fix it, and some progress has been made, but nonetheless, the issue is still here for now. AMD GPUs have no such issues, with their performance under VKD3D being near identical to the performance on Windows. Luckily, I don't play many DX12 games, and the ones I do play are not affected by this issue too badly. Also, I'm running a 5090. I just brute force through the problem and hit my monitor's refresh rate. I wouldn't go 
or a 5080 or a lower end card. If I played many VKD 3D games though, you will definitely feel the performance hit on those. Now, let us talk about the features of each brand. If you know anything about graphics cards, you probably already know that this is just a one-sided slaughter in favor of Nvidia. Usually what tends to happen is that Nvidia go on and introduce a new feature. That feature becomes industry standard everywhere and then AMD have to go and play catch up to Nvidia. Nvidia introduced upscaling, ray tracing and frame generation and AMD has still not caught up in terms of quality of their upscaler and the performance of their ray tracing hardware. With game studios pushing for fully ray traced games that use upscaling as a crutch to get acceptable performance, whoever has the best ray tracing hardware and upscaler has the best graphics card on the market and Nvidia happen to have both the best upscaler and the best ray tracing hardware. Sure, AMD has FSR4, but it's still only matching the OSS3, not the latest version of Nvidia's upscaler, which is the OSS4. Also, you can only really use FSR4 to its full potential on RDNA4 GPUs. RDNA3 owners can go fuck themselves, I guess. Meanwhile, Nvidia graphics cards, as old as Turing, that is RTX 20 series, can use DOSS4, which looks pretty decent even on its balanced and performance settings. So if you have something like a 2080 Super or a 2080 Ti, you can still play most modern games at decent settings, provided you reduce texture quality because, you know, those graphics cards do not have enough VRAM for a lot of modern games. If you have a 6800 XT, a 6900 XT, or a 6950 XT, you have to run stuff at native resolution and just kinda hope your card can brute force ray trace titles like Doom the Dark Ages, which, spoiler alert, it can't, or hope you get playable enough frame rates with FSR3 quality upscaling, which is implemented horribly in most cases, by the way. So you will definitely need OptiScaler in order to get it to look decent. For those of you with RDNA3 cards and older, I highly recommend using OptiScaler with DOSS inputs whenever you can so you can get the best quality upscaling possible with FSR3. Also, remember to set a custom scaling factor override because FSR3's quality mode uses 1.5, which looks horrible in most games. Here are my recommended OptiScaler settings for Doom the Dark Ages. When it comes to recording and streaming, AMD is much better these days than it used to be before RDNA 3. The FFmpeg VAPI AV1 encoder works really well, by which I mean it doesn't get overloaded easily and it looks pretty good. NVENC is still a little bit better overall, but the difference is negligible and not really worth considering unless you need to stream at absurdly low bit rates. At the bit rates people commonly stream at, I can't really notice any difference between the two. So if you have an RDNA 3 or newer card, you're good. Older AMD cards have terrible encoding. So if content creation is what you want to do, then upgrading to RDNA 4 is something you would have to do for best results. So, both brands have their strengths and weaknesses. On Linux, AMD's latest RDNA 4 generation is honestly much more appealing to the average person who wants to play video games. The Linux drivers for AMD tend to be far superior than those for Windows, and their compatibility with Linux software is way better than Nvidia's drivers. That said, having an NVIDIA GPU doesn't mean your system just breaks every other day, like some people will lead you to believe. I've had a relatively smooth experience with my 5090 on Wayland, so I'm sure the experience will be similar on any modern-ish NVIDIA graphics card.
The VKD 3D issue is something to think about though, if you're going for an RTX 5080 or weaker. As of the time this video was released, the RX 7900 XTX and 9070 XT will absolutely decimate the 5080 in raster VKD 3D games, seriously affected by the VKD 3D issue. But the 5080 will have a general advantage in ray traced games. In the mid and low end market, your only reasonable options are the RDNA 4 16 gigabyte cards. And maybe an argument can be made for the 5070 Ti in the mid range. But then you have to consider the DirectX 12 performance penalty on Nvidia. Do not consider RDNA 3 cards for even a second unless you can get them for dirt cheap. They do not have FSR 4 and upscaling technologies are getting more and more important. AMD doesn't really have a high-end GPU to sell you at the moment, so your only option currently is the 5090 in that segment, which works fine on Linux. Even when considering the DirectX 12 performance issues, you have so much power that it doesn't really matter in the end. And being able to use all the fancy NVIDIA features to their maximum extent is very nice. Do not be a buffoon that buys a 8GB graphics card in 2025. You are screwing yourself over if you buy anything with less than 16 gigabytes of VRAM because 8 gigabytes is just not enough for a lot of modern games and 12 gigabytes will probably be obsolete in like a year. In conclusion, I can say that AMD has a bit of an edge over Nvidia under Linux. Nvidia has a very strong feature set, but their GPUs suffer from an issue with VKD 3D performance in some games. So I would say consider your use case before choosing the right tool for the right job. If you want to use path tracing and buy an AMD card, then you have no right to complain because you knowingly bought hardware that sucks at the task you threw at it. Same goes if you're trying to play a raster VKD 3D game and you're getting half the frames you would get on an AMD card. Do your research before choosing. I hope you enjoyed my little ramble about graphics cards. I did one of these last time I switched from one brand of GPU to the other and I will inevitably make another one of these videos if AMD release a high-end UDNA GPU, which can compete with the highest end NVIDIA card. I would love to hear what you think in the comments, and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye bye.